Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open them to the book of Ephesians. Paul writing to the church of Ephesus, to the believers there, and he's uh, reminding them of something and then giving us some great, great biblical teaching here from death to life. From death to life. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10, and then, of course, you can see there's about 100 more verses for you there in the scriptures to help you with and so praise the lord so if everybody's in ephesians chapter 2 begin reading in verse number one with me and you hath he quickened we'll be looking at that a little bit and paul's going back and reminding the believers here and he begins now to give us here uh instructions and exhortation here of what the condition that mankind is in and that is all of mankind in all the world and that is who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also ye all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul reminds these believers what they were and what all of mankind is until they come to Christ, until there's a new birth, till there's a regeneration, till there is a quickening in their life by the Holy Spirit. But God, I'm always glad the Bible has but God, and it's always in the right place. It's a conjunction in the English language, but here's a contrast to what we just read to now. But God, who is rich in mercy, for with his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit uh, to, together in heavenly places in Christ. By the way, that's in the present tense. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in the kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So may we pray together now. Our Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the, even the way it started out uh, with the lights going out, but we were still able to communicate the word of God through the outside light and the help of a cell phone light. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory for it. Father, we thank you for now, what you're going to teach us, what we're going to learn from the Word of God, uh, what we're going to understand from the Word of God, because your Holy Spirit will now give us illumination. He will give us understanding. He will guide us into all truth. He will teach us the Word of God. He will bring to remembrance the things that God has said to us, uh, Father, and he will give us wisdom on how to apply what we're going to learn today from the Word of God. Father, I pray that every person under the sound of, of our voice whether here, on the internet, YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, television, radio, will hear the message that God has for them today for the condition that the majority are in and that they need to be made quickened and alive in Christ. Father, we pray you'll save souls for Jesus' sake. There'll be a multitude saved. We pray that the believer will be enlightened today of his position that he has in Christ, that he will praise you and glorify you and give you all the thanks and glory for what Jesus has done for him. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. We ask now that you would help your servant, that you would anoint his heart, mind, and lips in this hour, that you would give us the power and the unction that we need from the Holy Spirit to stand in this place and proclaim the truth of God's word and that it will have an effect on the hearts of men and women and boys and girls that will hear it and lives will be changed for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's talk just a little bit to open up with. We uh, uh, have a graveyard out here on our property. 
was mowing it Thursday, and as I was working on this, I was driving around and uh, trying to keep from bumping uh, everything as uh, the best we can. You know, you got a big six-foot deck mower, you got to be careful. So uh, sometimes if you see it tilted a little bit, that's all right. Just know the pastor hit it with the wheel or something, and you can shift it back. But as I was looking and thinking, uh, you know, there were different names. As the names came to my attention, I, I looked and, and I thought about them and those that I knew quite well. And I thought about the, the different personalities, the different temperaments, uh, the different uh, uh, interests that they had, hobbies, careers, work, a culture, uh, even uh, particularly what nationality they were, if they were Hispanic or if they were black or if they were uh, white, uh, you know, because we have a variety out there. And, you know, so there was a, a ver- whole variety of people out there. And uh, as I thought about that for a minute, I, I said, Lord, you know, there's all of this here and all the differences that are here, yet there's one thing that's in common that they all have in common. That is, they're dead. Same thing here this morning. We have a variety of people here, different races, different cultures, different nationalities, different interests, different hobbies, different careers, different jobs, and all of that. Yet, we all have one thing in common. We're dead in trespasses and sin. Unless we've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. That's the only thing that makes the difference. That's why 90% of the world out there walking around are dead. They're dead in trespasses and sin. And they need to be quickened, made alive by the Spirit of God. And that's through the new birth of being born again that's the only way that's going to happen and so Paul reminds these believers what they once were which describes the majority of the population today of the 8.6 billion people on this planet are dead in trespasses and sin and we must keep that thought in mind so we all have that thing in common So just to help us out with that a little bit, look at your first page there of your insert of your verses where it says introduction of verses. Want to just make something, clarify something and make sure that we all know and understand that everyone until they're saved is dead in trespasses and sin. We need to understand that. In Colossians 2.13, and you being, talk to me church, what? And you being what? Dead in what? your sins, and so forth, and uncircumcised of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You see, until you come to Christ, you're dead in trespasses and sins. Everyone. In Genesis 2, 17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Death. That's spirit, physical death as well as spiritual death separated from God for all eternity. Okay? In Genesis 3, 1 through 6, pick it up in about the middle there, verse 3. But of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Death. Okay? In Romans 5, 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sinned, now in Genesis, you know who that was that sinned, right? Who was it? Adam. Okay? Are we all clear on that? The beginning of the human race as we know it, 6,000 years ago, okay? Adam sinned in the garden. Okay? And so what happened? Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sinned. Who's that? Talk to me. Adam. Into the, so sin did what, church? It entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. See, we understand that. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. In Proverbs 21, 16, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of of the dead in John 11 25 and 26 Jesus talking to Martha and he said and said unto her I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die Martha do you believe this 
Okay? And then we can go on in Jesus. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. Jesus said, the thief uh, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. 2 Timothy 1.10 says, But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and have brought life and immortality to light through what, church? The gospel. So there gives you just a little bit of introduction so that we have a clear understanding that we are all at one time under the sentence of death. And the question is, is you got to move from death to life. you got to move from death to life. And that's what Paul is trying to get across here to these Ephesian believers. And so let's begin to take a look at it. Uh, you see, so how can we make the choice this morning from going from death to life? Okay? From going from being dead, uh, spiritually dead, to being alive in Christ. Because that's where we want to go and where we want to get to. So we've looked a little bit to the deadness of the natural man. The deadness of of the natural man as we found here in verses 1 through 3 as we began to look at it. And we want to move from that. And we have established the fact that man is dead in his trespasses and sin apart from Christ. Amen. Now you say, why are we preaching on this? Because there's a lot of people who need to get saved. There's a lot of people that need to move from death to life. And the only way they're going to do that is by hearing the truth. And they need to know that they're dead in their trespasses and sins. Period. Not just for here, because we don't know even who here. There may be somebody in here that has not been quickened and made alive by the Spirit of God. I don't know that. Only you and the Lord know that. Okay? But about all of those that are out there. So the, the deadness of the natural man here is, and I want to show you, to so share some things with you that Paul talks about here in the beginning. So let's look at some facts about the fact that man is dead in his sin and trespasses. That is, the natural man, uh, how dead he really is. He says it here in verse 2. Look at verse 2 with me. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So the first thing we see here, that the natural man is under satanic control. He's under satanic control. You see, God does offer us all a, a, a spiritual life. He offers us all to get out of the dead man into the alive man in Christ. But you see, the, man, the, the, the natural man today is under satanic control. Now, we know that by reading, looking in your second page of your verses now. Go to page two in your verses. It starts off with the deadness of the natural man. And it all began back in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 16. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, here's the five I wills of Satan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? This is, see, this is a guy that was, do you know who he was? He was right there with Michael and Gabriel, you see, the archangel and, and, and Michael, you see, and Gabriel, the messenger angel, and Satan, Lucifer, was right there. But, and you know who he was? He was the praise song leader in the congregation of heaven. He was the one that was to lead the praise music. And the praise song in heaven. And he got to the point where, hey, that's enough of praising him. I want all of this praise. Amen. And decided, I will, I will, I will. And as a result of that, that put man into the sin mode. And we had the death sentence passed upon us because then he caused Adam and Eve to sin in the garden. So the blame goes back to split foot. In John 8, 44, just reading some verses now to help us with this. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Anything that the devil says is a lie. Anything the devil talks to you about, whispers to you, brings to your thought and minds, don't you believe it, it is a lie. Because the devil is a liar from the truth and he is a father of lies. So don't you believe what the devil says to you or tells you because he is a liar. It is not the truth, it is a lie. And too many people are believing the lie today. That's why it's gonna be so easy when the Antichrist comes, God says, I will send them a strong delusion that they will believe the lie of the Antichrist. Why? Why? They're believing the lie now. You see. So when he, so you see the deadness of the natural man is under satanic control in 2 Corinthians 4 4. In whom the God of this world, who's that? That's the devil, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Revelation 20.10 And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Can I get an amen? You see, that's his final doom and end for him. But right now he is the prince of the power of the air that you're under control as a lost person because that's what Paul said in verse number two. Uh, Did you miss it? You walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He is the God of this world, he's referred to. He's referred to as the power of the prince of the air. So you see, the natural man is so dead because he's under satanic control. Hello. I hope you're getting this, okay. All right, so let's move on a little bit here as we take a look at that. All right, notice what else that Paul said in verse 3 there in our passage of our scripture. Everybody with me in verse 3? All right, he says, among whom you also will, will all had our conversation, that's our behavior, manner of living, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Are, are, we, are we on this? You good with me on this one? Not only does this man under satanic control, but he's under sinful condition. He's under a sinful condition, among whom also we all had our conversation, our behavior, our lifestyle, our manner of living. So that's the the condition, the sinful condition. Let me give you a few verses here with it. Now you don't have to, you can look these up if you like, but I gave you Romans chapter three, verses 10 through 20, because you know what it starts off with in verse 10, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Amen? Amen? There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. And you go on down through that and you get to verse 20, verse 23. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you see, man it has a sinful condition. Now that's found in Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 20. But look at Psalms 51 with me. Psalms 51, 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. See, you were born into sin. You were born with a sinful nature, you see, a depraved nature. This is the deadness of man. We sin because we were born like that. We sin because we practice sin. We sin because we choose to sin. And so this is the condition of the natural man. This is the condition of those that are dead in trespasses and sin. And Paul said, such were some of you. And there may be some of you still in that condition. There may be some of you that are watching by television, radio, internet, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, Live. Don't turn me off. Stay right there. You need to hear this. This will make a distance in your life where you'll spend eternity. That's how important this is. Souls are weighed in the balance, but they need to be told the truth. Not only that, look at what else he said there in verse 3 with me, if you look at it in verse 3. And we're by nature the children of of wrath. In other words, you and I were subject to curse. We were subject to a curse. That is sin and death and hell. By nature, we were the children of wrath. So let's pick it up in our scripture passages here and there. We left one out in Galatians 3.22 while ago. But the scripture hath concluded. What has concluded, church? That what? That all are under sin. So we need to make sure of that. All right, so we're subscribed, the natural man is under a curse, 
a subscribed curse. And he falls under what? By children, they were nature, the nature of wrath. You go, wait a minute. Well, let's see what the Bible says. Always let's look what the Bible says. In John chapter 3 and verse 36, he that believeth on the Son, who's the Son there? And what's the results? Have everlasting life. And he that believeth not, the Son of God, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Did you read that sentence? That's in the present tense. Do you understand that? The natural man, the lost man right now, abides under the wrath of God. Why? Because he is dead in trespasses and sin. That's the condition of the lost man. That's the condition of 8 billion people on this planet. They tell us only about 5% are saved and born again. There's 8.6 billion on the planet. 30, 35, 40 years ago, they interviewed Dr. Graham in his decision, Our Decision magazine, Billy Graham Association, asked him what he thought in the church across America and the world were lost. He said, I would say probably 50% sitting in the churches are lost. This was like 40, 50 years ago. Here a few years, 10 years ago, as he preached, approaching 100 in his last days, they interviewed him again. The, the, the journalist brought out the magazine. And I was watching it. said, Dr. Graham, 50 years ago, you made this statement. What is your statement now concerning this? He thought for a minute. It took him a little while to get his thoughts together as he was getting ready to pass on that threshold going to glory. He said, I would estimate today that 80 5% sitting in our churches across America and the world are lost without Christ. Why? Because they're the natural man. Why? Because they're dead in trespasses and sin, and they need to be made quickened alive by the Holy Spirit. That's why. And so we find here they're under the curse of sin, the curse of death. And, and James, and by the way, the wrath of God already abideth on them. Already, present tense, in James chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Revelation 21, 8 says, But the fearful, the unbelieving, who? The unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, notice, which is the second death. See, when you're born into this world, you're under the death sentence. Because you're born into sin, conceived in sin, you have the sin nature, and guess what? If you're born once, you're going to have to die twice. Because think about this, you're already dead, that's one, and if you die lost without Christ, that's the second death which spends an eternity in a place called hell. And by the way, hell is a real place. And people are going to spend an eternity there apart from Christ. It's not a figmentation of the imagination of the mind or some comic book or Marvel mystery or story or some Hollywood made up thing. Hell is real. Just as much as heaven is real. And there are people by the billions spending eternity in a place called hell if they don't get quickened alive by the Holy Spirit of God. If they don't go from death to life. That's what we want to do this morning. We want to get you from death to life. We're talking pretty tough, hard subject here today. But actually, it's not a hard subject. It's actually a, a wonderful subject. It's a powerful, a promising subject. It's a, a, it's a positive. It's uplifting because I can do as Paul said, I was once one of them. But that's where the majority of the world is today. Without Christ, they're dead People are walking all around us that are dead in trespasses and sin. And they're going to die physically. They're going to die spiritually, separated from God for all eternity. We have a story of it in Luke's gospel of the rich man. The Bible says in these fairs, he was dressed in purple and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus that sat at his gate begging for sores. And the Bible says, and the rich man died and in hell immediately. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes in torment. And Lazarus, the rich man, brother, was buried. He was buried. The other guy didn't get buried. He was carried off into Abraham's bosom. Father Abraham, 
Send Lazarus that he may take his finger and dip it in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, no, that can't happen. There's a great gulf, and you can't come here, and we can't go there. He said, all right, then I've got five brothers. Now, this is a man that's talking. This is a man that's seeing. This is a man that's thinking. He has a conscience. He has feelings. He's talking. He says, man, so i got five brothers. Send somebody to tell them. And Abraham said, no, if they won't believe one who's risen from the dead, they won't believe if somebody comes and tells them. You see, and this, he, why? Because hell is a place that's real, and people are going to go without Christ. Because why? They're dead in their trespasses and sins. Now, I know you don't want to hear this kind of preaching, but this is what's going to get you saved. This is what will get, get you born again. Oh, the curse, you see, we find in Revelation 21.8. We read that in Revelation 20.15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, this, folks, this is God's word. This is the authority here. In Luke 16, 19, 26, that's the story of Lazarus and the rich man. You can look it up and read it. So we see the deadness of the natural man is under satanic control. He's under a sinful condition. He's under a subscribed curse. Well, that brings me to the good part. Now we got that out of the way. Amen. Now we can all smile a little bit and relax. Okay. Here we go. Beginning in verse number 4 through 9. Oh, I love this in verse 4 through 9. Everybody there, what's verse 4 say? But God. Can you say that? But God. Isn't it great when we hear the sad news? Isn't it great when we hear horrible news? <laughs> but it's not fake news. What I shared with you was real news. It was the truth. The honest truth. And I'm going to share with you now another honest truth. That's real news. But God, isn't it great when, see, in the beginning of those verses, verses 1 through 3, there, 4, guess what? We were uh, without, in 3, we were without hope. We had no hope. We're lost, doomed for an eternity. Without God, without Christ, without heaven, in a place called hell that will be tormented in the flames of, of fire for all eternity. And where man is hopeless. What are we going to do? What can I do? Because why? I'm dead in my trespasses and sin. If we just stopped right there, we would be with all men most miserable and without hope, doomed and lost for eternity. But oh, right in the middle of that. You see, this is what's the problem with the world today. Everything's happening going wrong with the world. Oh, it's sitting on a powder cake. We're about ready to blow each other up and all of this stuff that's going on. And great famine and all, all of that stuff, yes, is going to come, but not right now. You understand? Jesus said you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars and all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Okay? So don't worry about what's going on. You worry about getting your loved ones saved. You worry about your loved ones and friends that are dead in their trespasses and sin, and they need to be quick and made alive in Christ. See, we got to go from being the dead man, the natural man, to the spiritual man, alive in Christ. And that's why in the middle of all this gloom and doom, in these two verses, three first three verses, Paul comes back and says, but God. See, when you put God in the equation, things change. See, if we put God back in America, things would change. If we put God back in our government, things would change. But instead we blaspheme him, we kick him out, and we wonder why we're in the mess that we're in. Because we left God out, and that's what's going on now. All the stuff you're hearing, everybody's talking about it, everybody's going to do blah, 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 blah. They forgot about there's a God who still runs things. You understand that? God is still in control, folks. Amen. Hallelujah. But I want you to see this wonderful second point this morning very quickly. I want you to see the display of mercy. All right, here we go. Let's read some, read some verses here to help us out just to start with, okay? Romans 5, 8, Romans 5, 6, and 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, what happened? Christ died for who? The ungodly. Say, that's me. For scarcely will, for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, oh, here we go again. But God, see, he, see when you leave God out, you're, 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 you're without hope in that first few verses 6 and 7. But we come down to verse 8. But God, now we're going to put God in the equation. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory over death through Christ. We have victory over, the, over being dead in trespasses and sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. So this wonderful display of mercy. Back to our text now in verse number 4. I want you to see this curious motivation. A curious motivation. Beginning in verse 4. Why? Would God step into our lives because we're sinners? We're sinners and God wants to save us. He wants to give us eternal life. He wants to give us salvation. That's why he steps into our lives there in verse number 4 of Ephesians here. Micah 7, 18 says there in your uh, verse notes there, Who is a God like unto thee? that thou pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. We're looking at the display of God's mercy in the middle of all of this. In Psalms 108, the scripture says, For the mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. That's God's mercy. In Lamentations 3.22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because His compassion fails not. Aren't you glad for the love of God today? Amen. Praise God for His love today. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. So we see this curious motivation. But secondly, I want you to see a complete metamorphosis. A complete metamorphosis. So how does, uh, how does he take us from death to life? Well, he quickens us. How many of you know what metamorphosis is? You may have had that in, in school, in biology or class or whatever, when you were growing up as kids. What did you do? The teacher would probably sometimes bring in a jar. There'd be some leaves in it, holes punched in it. And now boys and girls or young people, I want you to see in here, what I have in here is a caterpillar. Now, we're going to watch this for several days or weeks, perhaps, and pretty soon this caterpillar is going to form a cocoon around it. Form a cocoon around it. Amen? And then the next time we probably walk in, we're going to see a beautiful butterfly. Now, for all you evolutionists out there, that's not evolution. Metamorphosis is a change of form. That's what the word means. It means a change of form. That caterpillar took on a change of form to a butterfly. That's what God does to you and I when we get saved. He does it through metamorphosis. We have a radical, radical change of form. We've gone from death to life. We've become a new creature in Christ. We've had a transformation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new transformation. Now, I didn't turn into something else, but God changed my form from the natural man to the spiritual man, you see, from the lost man to the saved man, from an old nature to a new nature. I had a change radically, drastically change in my life. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It was, and by the way, it was complete. It was complete. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him. Then we come to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A change has taken place. A transformation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Luke said in Luke 15, 24, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and he began to be married. I was dead, but now I'm saved. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Why? Because I had a radical, drastical metamorphosis take place. I changed form. Oh, I'm telling you, this is what Paul's writing here to these believers. Now, these are young believers who just got saved under his ministry. Now he's giving them some meat. See, we're, we're having a little meat today. We're having what I'm hoping you're bringing tonight, filet mignon, steak, uh, prime rib, lobster, you know, all that good stuff. Amen. All right, praise God. So we have this complete metamorphosis. He quickens us. We have a change of form. We've gone from death to life. You know how that was done? Just like it was with the caterpillar. 
It's called regeneration. And that's done by the Holy Spirit of God. So you got to get regenerated. You got to go from death to life. And we're regenerated. That's what the word quicken means to be made alive by the, by the Spirit of God. Oh, man, I'm telling you, this is fantastic. Then we'll look at the last one here and we're close. All right, here we go. There we are. Ready? We're going back now. We're going to verses 6 through 10 in our text here. Verses 6 through 10. Now the direction of the new man. You see, there's the deadness of the natural man. Amen? The natural man is under satanic control, right? Are you with me? Say amen. He's under a sinful condition. He's under a a, a subscribed curse. But then, but God. We bring God into the equation now. The display of mercy. What a curious motivation that takes place here, what God does for us. It's complete what God does. When God does something, church, it's complete. It's complete. You got saved, you got saved completely. You didn't get saved installment plan. You didn't get saved partially, 20%, and you got to work to get the full 100%. Thank God when you got saved, you got saved. Thank God when the Spirit of God came in, you got quickened. You got regenerated instantly, radically, drastically changed. The moment of salvation. So we go from salvation to glorification. But in the meantime... There's sanctification. Oh, look at this. The direction of the new man, beginning in verse number six of our text tonight. And has, oh, 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 don't miss this, church. You just because what? Because God, who's rich in his mercy, hath quickened us, in verse five, right? Are you with me? Together with Christ, we're saved. Here it is. And hath, present tense, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, bless God, man. I have now an unparalleled position. I have a new position in Christ. Do you see that? Not tomorrow, not next week, but now. My citizenship is already in glory. Let's read the verse again. Don't miss it. Look at verse 6. And hath raised us up. Now Paul's writing these believers. Because we've been quickened by the Spirit of God. This is spiritually. Have been raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I now have an unparalleled position. I have been raised up to sit with Christ in heaven. That's now. That's present tense. I'm already seated in glory spiritually. Amen. You understand that? When you got saved, you got saved. When you got saved, you got raised up in Christ to sit with Christ in the heavenlies. You go over in Colossians and Paul says, our citizenship as believers is already in heaven. Past, present tense, already. Are you with me? Say amen, come on. Amen. Don't lose this. This is the position you have. Wow, this is, some, this is what I'm talking about. A radical, dra- drastic, radical change has taken place. Man, I've gone from death to life. I've gone from the old man to the new man. I've gone from the lost man to the saved man. From blind to see. Uh, from lost to found. I mean, we could go on and on with that list. And I now have a new position. And my position spiritually right now is seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Woo! Hallelujah! Man, I'll tell you that. If you don't think so, look at your notes there with me. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Everybody there with me? All right, we're on the fourth page, the last page of your notes there, your verses. In whom, who's that? Jesus. Ye also what? All right, so did you trust and believe in Jesus? All right. After that ye heard the word of truth. See, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. You heard the word, you heard the truth. And what is the truth? The gospel. Oh, thank you. The Yuan Gileon, the good news of the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Oh, thank God, church, listen to me. I have come from death to life. I have been changed radically. I have a new position seated with Christ. Oh, watch this. Don't lose this. And it is sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. Wow. That's fantastic. 
Oh, this is my new position. When you get saved, God positions us with Christ because, because of what Christ has done for us, and then he seals us with the Holy Spirit of God. That's our earnest down payment until the day of redemption, glorification. Woo, glory to God. Man, thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad you got the Holy Ghost? Aren't you glad he sealed you? In 2 Corinthians here, if we're taking a look at it now, it's a, now first of all, what did we learn here? We have an unparalleled position, and we have an unfinished picture. See, the picture's not over yet. Hello. Y'all still here, amen? Well, at least I hope y'all still here. Okay, there's an unfinished picture in verse 10. Look at verse 10 with me. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. All right, so what were his workmanship? See, the salvation church is just the beginning. That's why I said when you got saved, you got born again, you got made alive in Christ, you got quickened alive, now you're positionally, spiritually, you're seated with Christ in the heavens. Okay, that's justification, all right? You stand righteous before God, otherwise you wouldn't be there to start with. All right, amen? Okay, and now he talks about here that this uh, unfinished picture, there's coming a time when we're going to be glorified, but I haven't got there yet. So between salvation and and glorification, there's a thing we call sanctification. And it's a lifelong process of sanctification. Has everybody got that to understand? We're his workmanship. See, that's just the beginning. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, look what it says. But we all, say that we all, see, Paul's a southerner, uh, with open face beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord. Now notice he talks about a glass and the glory of the Lord. We behold it. Why is that? Because, see, you can look through a glass, right? Amen. Are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Are, are, are you with me here? How are we going to be changed from glory to glory? See, here's where we come with sanctification. You see, the Bible is considered two things in the Word of God. One is called the mirror. We look into the mirror, the perfect law of God's liberty, and we're able to see ourselves as we are. And when we see ourselves as we are, we really see what we're like and who we are. And we see our sin, we see everything. Because God's word reveals that truth to us. But it's also referred to as a glass. And you can look through a glass. See, when I look, when I look at the word as a mirror, it looks back at me and I see what I'm really am and who I am. But when I look through it as a glass, I see God's glory. Amen. And I'm being changed from glory to glory. That's what we call the process of, sal of sanctification as we see that and look through that because we're on our journey to becoming more conformed to the image of Christ. That's the goal. Okay, so, 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 so we see there, see, when we get saved, there's a radical change and we go from death to life, seated at Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. You see, so we have this new position in Christ, but the picture's still unfinished yet. Why? I'm his workmanship, you see. And so we have this, what? And notice what it says here. So we say, say so we have an unequal, unequivocal purpose in life. We still have a purpose in life. Look what it says in the last verse there. We're created for his workmanship in Christ Jesus, here it is, unto good works which God hath before ordained that what? We should walk in them. Are you with me? Say amen. See, that's why in Acts 2.41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Romans 6 forces, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, we have this purpose now in life. This is the journey of, of sanctification because we've now got salvation. We're headed for glorification, uh, KP. But in between, there's things, a thing called justification. And I'm God's workmanship. And I'm created to walk in a good works as God has ordained it. As we, that's this in between here. 
you see. So we need to understand that as we take a look at it and we see these verses here of this purpose and how did that take place. Then they, they gladly received the word. See, when we get saved, church, and born again, and we start this process of sanctification in our lives, of taking these steps forward till we get to come to glorification, the first step we take is baptism. That's the first step we take as believers. We call it believers' baptism. That's what he said here. They received or baptized. Romans 6, Paul gives a perfect picture of it and what it is. Did you know when you get into baptistry, water's up here. If the curtain was down, the water is horizontal. You are standing vertical. You know what that pictures? What you see in the background on the wall, the cross. Are you with me? And what do you do? Here you are. You're standing. Now you're identifying in Christ's death. Amen? You've died to sin. You've received Christ. You've been quickened, made alive in Christ. Justification's taken place. You're born again. You see, you have the new birth and all that we've talked about. You see, so now you're showing a picture of that as you stand identifying with Christ. You're dead to all of that now, you see. Why? Because you have gone from death to life. Watch this. What happens? You're dead to that. You're buried in a watery grave with Christ, and then you're raised to walk in the newness of life. It is a picture of the new life. It's a picture of the resurrected life that you now have in Christ. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. See, that's the first steps. And then from that point on, it's living the obedient life in Christ until we get to glorification, which will come one day because I have the blessed promise of the Holy Spirit of God that has sealed me until the day of redemption. Hallelujah. Now, see, there's a lot of good news in this too. But we can't excuse the bad news. See, we can't tell people the good news until we share the bad news with them. So you've got to let them know what's going on in here. And so what a beautiful picture here that, that, that our brother Paul has, has given to us as we, we've learned that the deadness of the natural man, he's under satanic control. He's under a sinful condition. He subscribed a curse, which is death. But, but in the middle of all that, but God. Now we bring him into the relationship of mercy and this curious motivation, a complete metaphor. And then our new direction that we have, I have a new position in Christ. I'm sitting in glory with Christ right now. Do you understand that? I just haven't experienced it yet. But that's coming. Because you see, when the trumpet sounds, oh, hallelujah, and the shout shouts, and I go up hither, I'm going to be changed, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Oh, my friends. You see, we talk about, you see, here's the neat thing about this. You're dead in trespasses and sin. You're made quick and alive in the Spirit of God. So you have this radical, uh, drastic, drastic, radical change, right? That's just the first one. You got one more coming. I'm going to be changed in the moment and the twinkling of an eye. I'm going from the physical to the spiritual to glorification. In the moment, another. Because see, I'm not glorified yet. I'm saved and the new man. I've had that radical change. But when that trumpet sounds, and I did learn to play the trumpet three years, can't play it anymore. Don't have the wind. That's why I lean on the pulpit and reach down here and get my oxygen mask. I'm going to be changed again, George. Radically changed. Drastically changed. Another metamorphosis. I'm going to change forms. Come on. You are too if you're saved. You're getting out of this body and you're going to get a glorified one. No more pain. No more sorrow, no more heartaches, no more surgeries, no more bad anything, no more curse, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more tears. Why? I'm going to be changed again, radically and drastically changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the trumpet sounds. The question is, are you ready? The question is, for those of you that are still with us, are you still dead in your trespasses and sins? You need to be made alive in Christ. You need to be quickened by the Spirit of God and you need to come to Jesus so you can have everything we talked about in the last two points, all right? 
Because right now, if you're without Christ, you're in that first one. Paul said you are dead in your trespasses and sins. Are you listening to that? I mean, here's, what, here's where you're at. You're walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, on whom we all have our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, the filling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The way you get out of that is get born again. The way you get out of that is let the Spirit of God quicken you, make you alive in Christ. Regeneration through the new birth. Did you know that Jesus talked about the new birth? How do you get the new birth? By being born again. 1 John 5 talks about that. I'll stay off my message for tonight. But Jesus talked about it too in John chapter 3. Three times he told Nicodemus, he must be born again. John said, those that know God are born again. In John 1, 5, 5, 1. Okay? So praise God. So that's how you do it, my friend. You have to come to Christ. Because you are dead in your trespasses and sin. And like the rich man in the story of Luke, you're headed for an eternal hell. And the wrath of God abides on you already. And I know that doesn't sound like good news, and it's not. But it's truth news. But you can get out from under that curse. And you can come to Christ and ask Him to forgive you and to cleanse you and turn and repent of your sin and come to Christ through the new birth, through the Holy Spirit, regeneration, being born again and being made alive. Because you see, my friend, you're dead right now. See, if you're born once, you're going to die twice. But if you're born twice... You're only going to die once. And some of us may not even die once if the rapture takes place today. But we will have another radical change, a transformation. You're going to see this cocoon, caterpillar, turn into a beautiful butterfly. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo! Won't that be great when we see Jesus? Won't it be awesome when the trumpet sounds and the shout shouts? But you got to be saved. You got to be saved. Now, I want to help you do that right now. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one looking. Talk to you for just a minute. It's not long, doesn't take long to do it. Not at all. Not even a long prayer. Words. You're going to believe in your heart, you're going to trust with your heart, you're going to have faith. And believe God in His Word and what He says. And God says in His Word, if you're willing to confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, call on the Lord, and receive Him, you shall be saved. New life in Christ. Quickened. Made alive. Let me help you do that right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads here in the auditorium. Those that are watching, listening, by whatever electronic means that you are, I want you to pray with me this prayer. These are words communicating with God. You're going to believe with your heart, though, okay? You're going to trust with your heart, faith, and believe God. Pray this with me. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess that I'm a sinner, God, and I've sinned against you in heaven. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And I turn from my sin and repent of it and trust Christ and my friend he will he will I do now believe that's faith Jesus died on the cross just for me he took my place he paid my sin debt I believe he was buried that he rose again the third day according to the Bible and so right now by faith I do call upon you Lord Jesus and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior to take me to heaven someday when I die or at that rapture thing the preacher was talking about. Oh, I want to thank you, dear Christ, for hearing and answering my prayer and giving to me eternal life, everlasting life, for quickening me and making me now alive in Christ. And I pray this simple little prayer by faith in Jesus' name, amen and amen, and praise the Lord. 
God bless you.